Hi guys. In order to keep the show ad free and increase the frequency of production, donations are a big help. Some of you have been very generous in donating, and I appreciate it greatly. If you could give to the show's Patreon account, it would result in good karma and buttress the show's prospects. The URL is www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash leader one, L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E, www.patreon.com slash leader one. Thank you so much. seem so scared. All I wanted to do was play with you. Please come and play with me. I'm so lonely. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? Don't be afraid. Come with me. I will show you where I play hide and seek. Do you want to play hide and seek? You hide and I'll find you. Dorothea Helen Gray was born on January 9, 1929, in Redlands, California. She was the sixth of seven children. Her parents were transient laborers who worked for large commercial produce farms. Her mother was an alcoholic, and baby Dorothea often imbibed liquor through her mother while weaning. Dorothea would lay in a stupor for hours at a time in an unchanged diaper due to her mother's negligence. This didn't represent the limits of that negligence. When it came time for Dorothea to eat solid foods, she was dismayed to find that there weren't any, at least not on a regular basis. Her elder siblings taught her how to scavenge for scraps. They would use her as a prop to solicit food from neighbors. This situation failed to register within the radar of social workers, so years of foster care would elude Dorothea at the time. Dorothea didn't benefit from such concerns, and when her mother found out about what her children were doing to procure food, she was outraged. She was indignant that they would shame her with this behavior. She reacted with corporal punishment. Due to their experience with their mother's moods, the older children would hit the road when they sensed that a beating might come their way. Lacking this experience so early in life, Dorothea, who could barely walk, was beaten regularly. Her mother, Trudy, was mostly angry at her husband, but she took it out on Dorothea. Trudy didn't take to parenting at all. She saw all the work required of her as unwanted chores. When she wasn't doing housework or beating the children, she ignored them, preferring to live in a world in which they didn't exist. She sought refuge in the bottle at these moments. Dorothea's father, Jesse James Gray, was rarely there. They would see him briefly on his way to work or to the bar, while Trudy was uncaring and abusive, Jesse seemed to truly detest his children. Whenever they came within arm's reach, he would hit them, just for the satisfaction of bringing them harm. He didn't want them around when he was home. It also didn't do them much good when he threatened to commit suicide in front of them. He wanted to be intimate with his wife. On these occasions, he would banish the children to the streets at night. The children were not bothered by this. It was another opportunity to scavenge for food. They were vulnerable to the volatility of petty criminals at that time of day. Though some of them were kind enough to give them some money, others would slap the children. Dorothea was so small and slight of build that the slaps would send her flying into the gutter. In some cases, the lecherous types would molest her and her sisters. Dorothea and her sisters were raped on more than one occasion, but they never discussed these incidents after the fact. <laughs> 
The children knew about sex before their experience with sexual assault. Their parents frequently had loud sex while making no effort to conceal the noise. They were also informed by the clergy at their church that sex was evil. They would have heeded the warnings and honored the urges to maintain self-respect if it hadn't been for the fact that their parents weren't feeding them, leading them to turn to the worst of society's dispossessed for assistance. Financially, circumstances got even worse for the family. Jesse contracted tuberculosis. To undergo care, Jesse quit his job. With its only source of income gone, the family was even more destitute. The family would also be perceived as a pariah in the community since their neighbors feared being stricken with Jesse's illness. The family received alms from their church throughout Jesse's quarantine. For a change, the children didn't have to beg strangers for money with the possible consequence of sexual abuse. Eventually, the donations petered off, as did Jesse's health. He died in the early months of 1937. Because they couldn't afford a real funeral, he was buried in the potter's field. Dorothea was eight years old at the time. Her father had always been distant, drunk, neglectful, and abusive, so there were few tears to be shed. Most of Dorothea's turmoil sprung from her fear of the abject poverty that was sure to be exacerbated now that not only was her father dead, but her mother was considered unemployable by the community at large. Turning to the last personal resource on which she could capitalize, Trudy became what we in 2021 would call a sugar baby. There were several men in town she referred to as boyfriends. While Trudy exchanged romance for finance, the children found themselves alone in the house more often than ever before. It wasn't uncommon for Trudy to disappear for weeks at a time. After the sexual encounters, Trudy would go to a bar to drink away the memories and the aftertaste following her defilements. This wasn't all bad. Though the children had to fend for themselves, they at least didn't receive any beatings. The oldest kids learned how to cook, and the younger children begged for food and money. Dorothea would earn her keep by cleaning for the Mexican families in the neighborhood who had been kind enough to help them. Another pivotal moment that occurred during Dorothea's childhood was the death of her mother. She was riding on the back of a man's motorcycle during an automobile accident, and she was instantly killed. When the police informed the children about their mother's demise, they took it in stride. They were relieved that their peaceful existence would no longer be disrupted by their mother's disorderly behavior. A disruption did emerge, however. The state care system took all seven children into custody. They were placed in orphanages. They were not placed in the same institution. Dorothea was separated from all her siblings. As if their lack of support wasn't bad enough, the orphanage was understaffed and underfunded. The food wasn't much better than what Dorothea scrounged from her neighbor's garbage. Dorothea was sexually abused at the orphanage. Dorothea was reunited with her siblings when her aunt went through the lengthy process of adopting them. The hardships and misfortune of Dorothea's childhood was something she preferred not to think about, and she didn't want others to think about it either. Later in life, she would tell people with no knowledge of her childhood that she grew up in Mexico. She would tell them she had 18 brothers and sisters, all happy and close-knit. With this as the backdrop, she moved as an adult to the United States. She even became fluent in Spanish to reinforce her deception. While living in Fresno, she tried to blend in with the Mexican community and invariably succeeded. Her life in Fresno was a stark contrast to her earlier years. It was more stable, for one thing. She attended school regularly. She was always clad in clean clothes. She enjoyed the relationships she forged with her extended family. Though she enjoyed living in the crowded family home of her aunt, the state's opinion was that it was too crowded. 
Compared to the living conditions she endured under her parents' roof, it was a veritable palace. But social workers felt it represented a danger to Dorothea and her siblings. Once again, they were placed in foster homes. These homes were scattered throughout California. Dorothea was ejected from house after house because, when pushed, she was abrasive and difficult. She was resistant to any rules that were placed on her, no matter how reasonable and fair. She was dumbfounded when informed that she was to observe a curfew and come home immediately after school. She had never dealt with these restrictions before. She was molded by neglect. Heading into her teenage years, Dorothea became very attractive, and her sense of self-worth grew in parallel. She only became more defiant in response to anyone's attempt to control her. Dorothea reached the end of her rope at the age of 16. She found a way to make her own money and decided to flee. She took a bus to Olympia, Washington. There she ran out of money. Following in her mother's footsteps, Dorothea turned tricks to pay the bills. With her blonde hair, blue eyes, and affected Mexican accent, she came across as exotic. She had no difficulty attracting regular business. It was 1945, and there was no better year to be a prostitute in the United States. Hordes of soldiers returning from World War II hadn't been with women in years, so there was a considerable surplus of wild oats to sow. She set up her business with a girl she met at the bus station when she arrived in Olympia. They rented two motel rooms to accommodate the volume of appointments that were made. One customer was a man named Fred McFall. He became infatuated with Dorothea. It got to the point where he would book a typical sex slot with bonus time just to talk with her. She told him about her life in Mexico and the tragedies of her parentage. Fred became convinced that she had a fall from grace and was not just typical gutter trash. He asked her for her hand in marriage, and with no better options on the horizon, she accepted. She was eager to capitalize on this union financially. She made sure to maintain her appearance since it was her most valuable resource. She had her hair done regularly and bought expensive clothing. They were married in Nevada in a lavish ceremony. They rented a small house in Gardnerville following their honeymoon. Dorothea was a nymphomaniac, and Fred wasn't always able to satiate her sexual appetite. He was pleased by her acumen in the kitchen, however, especially when it came to the Mexican food she prepared so well. She wasn't quite as effective in the rest of the house. She didn't do much cleaning, since she never had to do it before. Fred was used to the precision of military culture, so he was displeased. He did much of the cleaning himself. Dorothea doubled down in her efforts to please him in the bedroom, but it did little to dislodge the wedge that had been driven between them. Fred was relieved when Dorothea became pregnant, since he was excused from sexual intimacy. Dorothea gave birth to a baby girl a year after they were married. Dorothea did not bond with the child. She held her after she was born and felt absolutely nothing. Dorothea carried to the next generation the same kind of abuse and neglect she experienced growing up. When Fred returned from work, he would find that upkeep of the house was forsaken and the baby would be wearing the same diaper she wore when he left. Three months into the baby's life, Dorothea placed her care in the hands of her mother-in-law. Fred grew more distant toward Dorothea. It didn't help that when his mother came to return the child, Dorothea still had no interest whatsoever in raising her daughter. Fred was reluctant to confront Dorothea about this matter because she had taken to drink and would fly into a rage if she happened to be drunk at the time. Her alcoholism was becoming more and more problematic, to the point where Fred began to hear rumors that she was fooling around with other men. Whether or not this was true, she turned a lot of heads, and those heads belonged to men who were also sexually deprived to some degree.
To kill the boredom in her life, Dorothea cleaned the house. Fred interpreted this as a gesture of reconciliation, and he responded in kind, mostly in the bedroom. Dorothea didn't have any love in her heart, and she endeavored to fill the void with alcohol and sex. Fred misinterpreted her sexual expression as demonstrative of love. He assumed it would enrich their love and their relationship as husband and wife. He also assumed her feelings would foster a bond between mother and child. He was wrong on both counts. Immediately after she gave birth to their second child, Dorothea was already talking about adoption. Parenthood doesn't suit every temperament, and maternal feelings just weren't in Dorothy's DNA. She gave the child up for adoption and gave a cover story to Fred as to where the baby had gone. Fred was unaware that his second child became the property of strangers. That is, until he confronted her about the truth, and she told it. She didn't want the kid, and she gave it up. She was too self-centered to consider that Fred might want to raise the child as a single parent or in tandem with his mother. Dorothea was too narcissistic and self-centered to bother herself about that. Fred scrambled to inquire of all governmental authorities about the location of his child. It was all in vain. The mother signed the custodial rights away, and it was legally binding. His feelings were about as important to Dorothea as the babies. Fred's next step was to petition the government again, this time for a divorce. Dorothea didn't protest or contest. She gathered up some money, packed her bags, and took a train to Los Angeles. It was 1948, and Dorothea arrived in a new city with a fresh start and zero prospects. This also came with a falsified background story, this time involving her husband. Divorce was still frowned upon at this point in history, so she felt more dignified lying about her ex-husband's fate, claiming that he died from cardiac arrest. Dorothea rented a small apartment in an indigent neighborhood. She planned on resuming her career as a prostitute. She anticipated more business this time around, since Los Angeles is a much bigger city than Olympia. This was not to be. It was three years since the end of the war, and everybody was keen to settle back into domestic harmony. Many soldiers married and started families. They didn't want to blow it by gallivanting with whores. Another obstacle was her physique. She was still young at 19 years of age, but her body was ravaged by two bouts of pregnancy. She also ate like someone who had once been neglected of food, and she just wasn't as enticing to potential Johns as she was in 1945. She was still attractive, but not in the lights of society's beauty conventions. She still managed to establish a clientele, but she didn't make the kind of money she did before. And to supplement her income, she stole money from them when she could. She would try to ply them with liquor so that they may pass out, and she could both avoid having sex with them and ransack their homes for money and valuables. She was making as much money from this as she did years before from turning tricks alone. She had a run of good luck at this for a while, but that luck ran out in 1949. Bartenders told police about what she had been doing since she met her Johns in their establishments. She was arrested for fraud. The judge was lenient, sentencing her to a year in prison with the possibility of parole after six months. Jail is never a pleasant experience, and it got even worse for Dorothea because of her poor housekeeping. Her cell ran to squalor due to her disregard of the upkeep that was expected of a typical inmate. She was not only written up and penalized by staff, but her fellow prisoners also looked down upon her. They treated her as if she were worth less than the filth that accumulated in her cell. Though self-improvement was not a goal to which she ever aspired, she did have pride. Being considered worthless and foul was an affront to her dignity. This she could not accept. So finally she was motivated to clean her space. It wasn't because Dorothea wanted anybody's friendship. She had been a loner for the most part, 
and only involved herself with relationships when she identified factors that were ripe for exploitation. Her looks were fading, so she realized that if she cultivated bonds with well-connected people, she could elevate her status in the world. Realizing this, she befriended many of her fellow inmates. They were just as keen to capitalize on the friendship as she was, and the benefits flowed both ways. Among the benedictions were lessons and advice on how to become more effective as a criminal. She learned how to pick pockets without getting caught. She learned the fine art of forgery. She even learned how to avoid arrest by hearing stories from other inmates on their experiences of being detained. By the time she was released, she was a changed woman. This didn't mean she was determined to go legit. She just knew how to make more money as a miscreant while avoiding arrest. With some guidance from Los Angeles' more successful prostitutes, she increased her take from that endeavor. Eventually, she rose to a more comfortable level of material security, and she enjoyed a lavish, if not wealthy, existence. This screeched to a halt when she got pregnant again. Her looks had already faded for good. She didn't have access to a safe abortion procedure. She couch-surfed and mooched from relatives and her foster parents for as long as she could. She gave birth to the baby in San Francisco in 1950. She identified the father as just some man. He paid her an extra dollar to refrain from wearing a condom. It was a dollar baby, though it was worth even less in her biological mother's eyes. And it was no doubt better off with its adoptive parents. During her time in San Francisco, Dorothea turned tricks, but also profited from her skills in theft and check fraud. She hated the position the pregnancy put her in, which meant having to depend on the kindness and charity of strangers. To quote the poet Rimbo, one sells one's liberty when one accepts a kindness. Financial independence afforded Dorothea liberty, and from that point forward, she was determined to maintain that state of affairs free of compromise. Finding another sucker to marry and exploit for his money was not at all undesirable to Dorothea, but her own desirability was slipping away from her. Her habit of overeating continued unabated, and the consequences were manifested in her figure. Dorothea met a man named Axel Johansson, who was a merchant seaman. His work required long jaunts of travel. He made a good living, and he wasn't always around to spend his money. When Dorothea took these criteria into consideration, she could hardly resist. Their courtship was touch and go. He was called away to sea so often it was hard for her to plant her flag. Nevertheless, as soon as he returned home from each trip, he was eager to reconnect with Dorothea. Like she had with the others, the story of her past she gave him was fabricated. As far as he was concerned, she was a native of Mexico, and her occupation was as legitimate as his. She even told him she had been a member of the famous dance troupe, the Rockettes. They manufactured gravitas and pathos with which this self-styled actress sold these deceptions, convinced Axel that Dorothea was the real deal. Demonstrative of the notion that the express lane to a man's heart ran through his stomach before making an exit for his loins, he was just as won over by her skills in the kitchen as he was by her virtuosity in the bedroom. Axel was remembered as being gruff and uncouth, but this meant nothing to Dorothea, and that meant a lot to him. It was exactly what his ego needed after a chain of rejections. Axel and Dorothea married and settled down in a suburban district before his next deployment. This time alone suited Dorothea well. She could eat and drink as she pleased. She also didn't have to clean the house until Axel returned. The problem was, her alcoholism left her in a daze and she lost track of time. Her husband returned from his excursion at sea to a pigsty, and an inebriated wife passed out in bed. Axel was outraged and disgusted by her drunkenness, neglectful housekeeping, and slovenly appearance. He beat her, and it stoked her into action. 
She cleaned the house top to bottom and prepared a sumptuous meal for him every night. She would have lengthy conversations so that she could further prove that she was actually participating in the marriage. She embellished her claims about her stint as a rockette, boasting of associations with celebrities. The more she exaggerated these details, the more tiresome she became to Axel. Plot holes began to appear in these stories, and as his skepticism grew, he became increasingly distant. He was filled with dread upon envisioning what would become of her after his next deployment. Nevertheless, her spending dwindled their savings to the point where he faced no other recourse but to take to the sea. While Axel was away, Dorothea drank the boredom away. She also passed the time by bringing men home from the bars. It is not known if these men were prostitution clients, but her neighbors reported their visits to Axel. Axel was infuriated, and he dished out more beatings to Dorothea. She didn't blame him. The way she saw it, he was only trying to correct her wayward behavior. It was a pattern that continued throughout their marriage. 1961. In those days, the occupation she invented for the unfamiliar was that of holistic doctor. That seemed at least quasi-legit, considering that there were always drug bottles and books in her home describing numerous medications and their effects. She was forced to maintain this cover story when people began turning to her in the event of a malady, a development she could have done without. Axel took this as a good sign. He felt that involving her with friends and the community at large would set her on a constructive path, with the needle pointing towards self-improvement. The truth was, she was more apothecary than physician, a drug dealer, essentially. For all she and her patients knew, she could have come perilously close to poisoning them to death. The cover story she gave to Axel told of a medical training she underwent in Mexico. He now realized that her constant rewriting of her personal history was endemic to some kind of troublesome pathology. He felt her reckless distribution of medications to neighbors was likely putting both Dorothea's and their lives at risk. For everyone's safety, he had Dorothea committed. It would be an understatement to say Dorothea's stint in the psychiatric ward of the hospital was ineffective. The criminally insane were tossed in with members of the general public suffering garden-variety personal crises. One troublesome bonus feature was the cocktail of infectious diseases that permeated the air, courtesy of sailors who imported them into town from all over the planet. Arriving at a fitting diagnosis for Dorothea was not an easy task for the attending physicians. Her accounts of the story of her life shifting in narrative and detail, left them in confusion. She pleaded for their sympathy, but given that they were unaware of the nature of her personal truth, they were unsure of whether she was deserving. The mental health care system was still evolving, so from the top of the system downward, there was just as much uncertainty about mental illness at the executive level as there was among the patients. Dorothea established a behavioral pattern soon into their assessment. She had a tendency to manipulate others. Given her lack of empathy for the targets and remorse for the intended exploitation, she was diagnosed with undifferentiated schizophrenia. The doctors felt she was unable to distinguish between hallucination and reality. They concluded that this was the reason she seemed to feel no emotion for anyone who infiltrated her orbit. Their recommendation was cessation of all alcohol consumption, which they felt exacerbated all symptoms of her illness. With this, it was settled. She was to be discharged and reassigned to her husband's care. By this juncture, Dorothy approved to Axel that there were no grounds on which he could trust her. She would befoul their home, spend all his money, drink to the point of madness, and cuckold him left and right. She had become an embarrassment and a traitor. He could no longer beat into her the motivation to at least keep up appearances in the eyes of their neighbors and friends. Dorothea resented being committed to the hospital, 
and the distance that separated them during her stay would remain between them metaphysically. The gap between them only grew wider with the passing of every day. While he was home, she was incarcerated and sober in their house. Axel became her only source of companionship, but he seldom spoke to her at that point. Stigma is part of the baggage that comes with mental illness, and that was even more true in the 1960s than it is now. Axel kept Dorothea's stay in the psych ward a secret from outsiders. He would tell them she was visiting relatives. Coming up with more and more excuses and lies was as tiresome and stressful for Axel as it was effortless and thrilling for Dorothea. As usual, he sidestepped their guaranteed descent into financial ruin by resuming his commercial activities at sea. As always, he dreaded the sight he might see upon returning home. He reappeared to find a house that was not just clean, but immaculate. All clutter had been gathered up and squirreled away. Dorothea was a mess, but she wiped herself free from Axel's life without a trace. No goodbye note. She came to his life with nothing and left him nothing. Dorothea moved to Sacramento with what remained of hers and Axel's savings. Her objective was to establish herself financially, utilizing her experience and knowledge of the sex trade. She could no longer profit from her own physical merits, as with age and weight gain, the value of her personal assets plummeted. She rented a house and established a cat house, whose personnel included some of the city's finest sex workers. It didn't take long for the police to catch on. One day, an undercover cop came to her door. He conveyed a lack of interest in the other women, so Dorothea offered him oral sex at a discount. For the police, this act was pay dirt. Dorothea and her girls were arrested and taken to the closest police detachment. She denied that she was involved in prostitution in any way, but the court didn't buy it, and she was sentenced to 90 days in jail. Going back to jail proved to be somewhat of a mixed blessing. She was forced to put a temporary stop to her alcoholism. The imposition of a routine on what had otherwise been a chaotic life gave her the kind of structure that forced her to sort herself out to some degree. Not everything was corrected, however. The symptoms of her mental illness were exacerbated. She continued to lie to people about her past, only now the final version was etched in stone. She may have lied, but the final draft was locked and ready for public consumption. In the meantime, Axel was preparing their divorce. She couldn't be released from prison without a fixed address, but when she called Axel, he didn't answer, and this was decades before call display. She went to his house anyway after being released, and because she wasn't welcomed back, she was arrested for vagrancy and sentenced to another 90 days. He just wasn't the same lovelorn fuck puppet that accommodated her every whim. Bearing this in mind, she developed an action plan to establish a steady revenue stream. She resumed her career as a holistic doctor of dubious credentials. She read medical books and committed to memory as much data as she could. She impressed the other inmates with her medical knowledge, and some of them provided her with their connections to the healthcare industry on the outside. After she was released, Dorothea went to work as a nurse's aide in homes that cared for the elderly and disabled. Essentially, she was a personal support worker. She found it boring, and she was dismayed by the exiguity of the financial compensation. Dorothea's tendency toward opportunism and malfeasance began to emerge throughout her employ at this legitimate enterprise. When she cooked for clients, she would prepare enough to take some of the food back to her home. Her clients didn't object since they were so grateful for the attention and care. Medication frequently went missing as Dorothea tidied up their homes, but it was never a cause for concern because the patient's doctors were always willing to replenish what had fallen through the cracks. It didn't end there. Dorothea began to raid her clients' liquor cabinets. Drinking was Dorothea's primary source of amusement at that time of her life, especially since her sex appeal dwindled and shed all of its market value. 
Spending time with the aged and infirm was not her idea of a party, so she alleviated the boredom in the only way she knew how. It kept her insanity intact, and the consequences of any lapse in mental stability were sure to trouble her clients more than a few fingers of missing whiskey. Dorothea also didn't see any shame in pocketing any loose change that happened to be lying around. It went unnoticed anyway. Two terms in prison taught that old dog new tricks, but not the kind that would set her straight. Her disposition in the eyes of her clients was remembered as friendly and cheerful. She didn't come across as shady and shifty, so there was no reason for them to suspect anything. Their trust in her was total, but ripe for exploitation. They had no idea what they were getting into when they assigned Dorothea to handle their banking transactions. She deposited their social security and pension checks. Whether during a deposit or withdrawal, this scavenger bird of prey got her beak wet at every opportunity. The way she saw her clients, they were carrying in waiting, with open pocketbooks bleeding every dollar she could get her hands on. She was very careful about the amount she stole and the clients she stole from. Dementia and Alzheimer's disease provided the most fertile ground for this activity, and their income was denuded by Dorothea's financial abuse. She extorted these funds with smiles and contrived empathy, and her clients were never the wiser. Dorothea hoped to become a recipient of charity in her own right. She would meet with social workers and spin tales of woe about counterfeit afflictions from which she suffered. Breast cancer, brain tumors, liver cancer. The story switched so often that without realizing it, she would tell someone a different version of the same story. Nobody believed her, but she was lucky in that they all assumed she was a hypochondriac instead of a con artist. They assumed that this could become problematic while caring for her charges. Such a pathology besets many healthcare workers, so there were no consequences as she sought to swindle the system. Dorothea would administer sedatives and other drugs that induced stupors in her clients, so that they would be so high they wouldn't notice her pilfering their belongings. When she couldn't con them into taking extra medication for this purpose, she would grind it up and serve it to them in their food. The liquor and spicy Mexican food concealed the flavor of the dope she was feeding them. She retired from this line of work in 1966. Some of the patients died, but Dorothea was never suspected as an executioner. The medication found in their blood was prescribed by their personal physicians. Generously endowed with a substantial amount of savings, Dorothea rented a large house at the corner of 21st and F Street. She didn't need all of the space, but she knew she could profit from it. She made a goal of transforming the structure into a boarding house. It wouldn't be easy to obtain a license, not with her criminal record. It was a better option than prostitution, which was completely off the table by then. Though she was within spitting distance of 40, she looked like she was closer to 50, or even 60, depending on who you asked. She also didn't have the energy to work as a nurse's aide. Renting rooms and providing some basic care to the disabled was more within the realm of possibility for Dorothea at that stage of her life. It would also mean that if she handled their finances, she could embezzle money for herself, and none of them would clue into it due to their naivete and inability to live independently. Another problem she faced, besides the licensing requirements, was the exhausting menial labor that was required to prepare the house so that it would be primed and ready to accommodate several high-maintenance adults. The heavy lifting, the painting, and other upgrades were more than she could handle. She tried hiring homeless people, but they were too unreliable. She turned to the local Mexican community. Deceptive as she was to everybody she met the first time, she bamboozled them into thinking she too was Mexican. Her sob stories were effective. Several Mexican locals, upon learning she was opening the house to care for the elderly, reported for duty. There were several undocumented workers who would accept payment in cash, and they went to work on the house that would change Dorothea's life, and those of many others, with irrevocable consequences.
Just as it seemed more and more unlikely with every passing day, a man came into Dorothea's life with amorous and romantic intentions. Roberto Puente was an immigrant from Mexico. He was 20 years old when he fell in love with Dorothea, or at least that is how he came across. It wasn't coincidental that she had money and could help him get a green card. The attraction was mutual, and soon all the other workers were laid off. Roberto did all the grunt work on the boarding house, and he was compensated with room, board, food, and all the fringe benefits that came from dating your boss. The boarding house opened its doors in 1966. All 24 rooms were immediately filled. The area's social workers were flooded with housing requests for the homeless and disabled, and they were relieved that an option to place their charges with a house that provided meals, laundry, and other care presented itself. As far as they were concerned, the landlady was St. Dorothea. They were willing to look past the fact that the home wasn't licensed. Though other homes offered more services, the residents of Dorothea's home would live better than they would in a homeless shelter or flop house. 1968. Dorothea and Roberto were married in Mexico City. It was an extravagant affair, and she loved being in Mexico. She wasn't looking forward to her new life of providing care for those in need back in Sacramento, however. Another unfortunate footnote to the otherwise joyous occasion was that Roberto had a roving eye, and she feared that his furtive glances could advance to consummated acts of infidelity. Sure enough, after Roberto's citizenship status was confirmed, his loyalty to Dorothea began to drift. The truth was that he was not sexually attracted to her. From his standpoint, their sexual encounters brought him about as much pleasure as the hours of painting and hammering he carried out to complete the house. Their estrangement began when he moved into one of the spare rooms. He told her it was because she snored. He wasn't so stupid as to bring another woman to the house. The residents were quite taken with Dorothea, with her being a maternal figure of sorts. They would gladly inform on Roberto if they caught him cheating on Dorothea. As Dorothea's reputation grew in the community as a kind and charitable woman, outsiders notified her when they saw Roberto with another woman. He was dating girls his own age. He kept them all in the dark about his marriage and all his other relationships. He was a Lothario, essentially. Dorothea was not disturbed by Roberto's disloyalty at this point. As long as he engaged in these activities behind closed doors and presented a respectable facade to the local Mexican community, she could accept it. Dorothy found a new way to elevate herself to the upper echelons of society. She became a patron of charities. She attended events that were frequented by public figures. She befriended Ronald and Nancy Reagan, which led to associations with other politically connected people. She was thrilled to meet Clint Eastwood, though she was disappointed that he was more interested in his date than in her. She was so far past her prime it was indiscernible from that distance. She was donating so much money to charity that she wasn't leaving enough behind to outfit her with the lavish lifestyle she enjoyed. She stole more and more money from the residents. Not only did they not catch on, but her reputation in the community as a benefactor for the underdog was impervious to suspicion. Besides, who would the police be more likely to believe, a paranoid schizophrenic or Dorothea Puente? Society wasn't exactly kind to the mentally ill, and given the nature of their conditions, their credibility was assumed to be afflicted by delusion. When she was accused of misappropriating money from her boarders, social workers were either skeptical or relieved that someone's liquor money was being confiscated, seeing that as exactly what the doctor ordered. Roberto not only avoided Dorothea's bedroom at all costs, but he spent little time in any other part of the house, and the building fell into disrepair. Dorothea resorted to hiring homeless residents of the neighborhood to do odd jobs. Social workers visited frequently, and if she couldn't keep up appearances, she would stand to lose everything. Roberto would accompany Dorothea to the charity dinners to take advantage of the sumptuous feasts 
and free liquor, but otherwise they spent very little time together. When they did talk, they argued. Roberto was not subtle about his distaste for Dorothea's appearance, and their marriage deteriorated even more as a result. When he finally left, she was relieved. She was tired of maintaining the facade that they were a happily married couple. It also meant there was one more room she could rent out, and she would have more money to steal. Dorothea went bar hopping, feeling better than she had in a long time. Barflies began renting rooms from her, and it wasn't just money with which they earned their keep. Dorothea would accompany a man her age to his home. She would drug his drink, and once he'd pass out, she would rob him blind. Reports of these incidents began to trickle into the police department, and the hunt for a suspect began in earnest. She was never caught, however. Dorothea married again. She met a man named Pedro Montalvo in 1976. She met him in a bar, and she was so taken with him she didn't even drug his beverage. Dorothea never filed the marriage with the government because it would have meant she would be charged with polygamy. Concerned about the repercussions of introducing him as her husband to her high society friends and well-connected members of the Mexican community, she invited few of them to her home, and only once or twice to keep up appearances. This union took a dark turn. Pedro was very physically abusive to Dorothea, beating her savagely, especially when he was drunk. Dorothea withdrew from him and no longer lived in the same room. She would spend more time with their tenants. For once, she enjoyed their company. They adored her, and she badly needed the adulation. They were grateful for the ways in which she protected them from the harsh realities of the outside world. Pedro would not strike her while she was sitting with her rumors. Realizing he was no longer welcome, Pedro left Dorothea two months after their wedding. He was the last of her husbands. If she needed love and attention, she would get it from the people in her care. Dorothea became active as a mentor to younger women in the community. She helped them with everything from birth control to divorce proceedings. They referred to her as La Doctora. Dorothea made her rounds of the bars again, only this time she took a different tack in pursuit of money. She would gather intel on the men, and if a man was collecting a pension or social assistance, she would make a fake change of address claim so that the checks were sent to her house. So much money was coming in through her mendacious methods of procurement that even with all her self-indulgent expenditures, she still enjoyed a comfortable lifestyle. This was further augmented when she met a woman named Ruth Monroe, who was keen to open a seafood restaurant. Dorothea had been influenced by her wealthier friends when they spoke of investing their money. The investment paid off and Dorothea could sit back at her house knowing that more money was rolling in and with minimal effort. 1982, Dorothea learned that a redirection of government checks was reported to the police and they were gathering evidence to issue an arrest warrant. The men she stole from were very cooperative with the investigation, and it was a tremendous help. The police, having once been aware of similar allegations made by her tenants, began to pry. Ruth Monroe's fortunes took a turn for the worse. Her husband was stricken with cancer, and she sold her house and almost every other asset in her name so she could outfit him with palliative care. Dorothea gave her a room when Ruth was at her most destitute. Ruth was grateful and relieved. At first. Then something changed. Something internal. She wasn't feeling so well. She was sluggish in the morning. She was tired in the afternoon. Dorothea would wait on her during these spells. Never much of a drinker, Ruth made a regular practice of drinking cocktails to soothe her nerves, since the onslaught of symptoms began to worry her. Though her affliction may have appeared to be idiopathic, the truth was that Dorothea was drugging her. Her son William was alarmed when he visited and found her to be pallid, too weak to stand, and apparently untroubled by it all. 
He heard more of Dorothea's stories, but despite all her altruistic posturing, something didn't add up. There was a void behind her cold eyes. William could not shake off his suspicion that Dorothea didn't have his mother's best interests at heart. The problem was, evidence was lacking. Unfortunately, he didn't figure it out by the end of April 1982. It was at that time that Ruth died. Police investigated. There was a lengthy paper trail that Dorothea Puente walked as a suspect. There was no evidence of her culpability in Ruth's death, however. Dorothea was devastated, at least by outward appearances. Initially, it was by the loss of her friend, though her reactions to that development were likely contrived. The loss that troubled her the most was the closure of her business. She was also traumatized by the interrogation to which she was subjected. She didn't come across as anyone's idea of a cold-blooded murderer, so police looked elsewhere for an explanation. The autopsy found a massive overdose of medication in Ruth's system. The death was ruled a suicide. There were no signs of grief in Dorothea as she went about her daily business. With thievery and deception as the engine of her livelihood, little would change as long as she could turn a profit. Dorothea may have been content to carry on as if nothing had happened. William, not so much. He was sure Dorothea was responsible for his mother's death, and he was determined to prove it. He pored over his mother's banking records until he discovered that transfers were being made from Ruth's savings account into her business. Money from the sale of her house was also funneled into this account. Dorothea had access to this account. William planned to notify the police the moment Dorothea withdrew so much as a nickel. If only he had been aware of who he was dealing with. Dorothea had moles in the police department, even if they were withdrawing their support one by one. She was advised to procure the services of a criminal lawyer. Dorothea came up with her own solution. She would flee to Mexico. Unfortunately for her, the police were notified that she bought her ticket. They pulled over her taxi as she was headed to the airport. Her plan was to retire south of the border with Ruth's savings to cover her living expenses. The outlook for Dorothea Puente wasn't entirely grim. Though 30 fraud cases were being prepared with Dorothea as the perpetrator, the investigations were not complete by the time of her first court appearance. The judge discounted them and all previous convictions when it came time to sentence her. Dorothea played the victim card as always, and her connections to the upper crust, with all her contributions to charity, preceded her. She was able to reap the one benefit her reputation afforded her. She was given the benefit of the doubt. She was sentenced to five years for the three robberies she was proven to have committed. One of the terms of her parole was that she would never again be allowed to run a boarding house, nor could she work with the disabled and the infirm. Next stop for Dorothy Puente, Sacramento County Jail. In jail, Dorothea became a den mother of sorts. Not only was she old enough to be a mother figure, but she was more experienced than most of the population with crime and punishment. A change came when she informed on another inmate. As the saying goes, snitches get stitches. Dorothea was cornered in the showers and nearly beaten to death. In the infirmary, she was found to have cracked ribs. She was transferred to solitary confinement and protective custody until the dust settled. That was the idea anyway. Dorothea activated a conflict that continued for nearly a year. After the perpetrators of the beating were identified, more violence ensued. This meant little to Dorothea. All that troubled her was the boredom and loneliness of isolation. One coping mechanism came in the form of a man named Everson Gilmuth. A lonely widower, he was unsure of how to approach dating in his 70s. He turned to women's prisons in pursuit of companionship. Somehow he established a pen pal relationship with Dorothea, and their friendship eventually blossomed into a romance. Or at least that was his interpretation. The truth was that he was just being conned. He put money in her commissary account, a gesture that no doubt retained her interest. 
When Dorothea returned to general population and her mail was no longer being monitored, the relationship with Gilmuth switched gears. They now began to discuss details of how they would approach a serious relationship upon her release. Everson planned to move to Sacramento. There was talk of a wedding. Everson was a man of his word. Dorothea was paroled after three years, and Everson was parked outside the prison waiting for her. They had their first kiss and rode off together. Everson's financial situation was rosy, to say the least, and Dorothea couldn't have been happier. They bought a small house together with Everson putting up the collateral, and they opened a joint banking account with the purpose of financing the wedding. Everson even deposited his pension in that account to provide proof of income so that they could mortgage a new boarding house. They both walked in the bank wearing smiles, but with mismatched agendas. Dorothea's long-range plan was to ensure she continued to receive Everson's pension without him being around to collect it. Dorothea's services to the underdogs of Sacramento society continued to pay off. There was something different about Dorothea's approach to filling her rooms this time around. Rather than establish a steady and reliable revenue stream with people guaranteed to stay long-term, Dorothea admitted those who were most likely to live a transient existence. Alcoholics, drug addicts, the mentally ill, drifters, and criminals. They were never turned away. Everson was astonished by Dorothea's altruism, and his admiration was commensurate. She had pulled the wool firmly over his eyes, and it could not be displaced. If only someone had warned him what was soon to follow. Everson became enfeebled. He lay in bed most of the time, so sluggish that moaning and groaning represented the apex of his energy expenditures. It wasn't long before he groaned his last breath. The circumstances would look shady, no doubt, just like with Ruth. Everson may have been in his 70s, but he was in good health. He was filled with drugs, and it would not be perceived by police to be coincidental. If the police in the corner had a look at Everson's death, it would be an open and shut case for Dorothy Puente. Anxious to avoid this fate, she found a solution. It didn't involve a trip to Mexico. This time, avoiding prosecution only merited a trip to her backyard. First things first. Typical of most corpses, bodily waste oozed from every orifice. Everson's deathbed was drenched in vomit, urine, and feces. This would have made it very easy for any pathologist to ascertain the cause of death. They might not even have needed to examine the body. Recalling corpse disposal methods she observed during her days as a nurse's aide, Dorothea wrapped Everson in sheets like a cocoon. She sewed them shut. This wasn't entirely successful in containing the swamp of bodily substances, so she wrapped his corpse in plastic. She wrapped layer after layer until not even the stench of rotting flesh could be detected. The next problem to be dealt with was transportation. How would she get the cadaver out of the house? It's not an errand, you ask, just anybody to help you with. Though Dorothea was anything but frail at the age of 56, she was not strong enough to haul the dead weight of Everson Gilmuth. Her solution to this was to deposit Everson's corpse into a wooden box, which was nailed shut. A man she hired to work on the house transported the box with her in a taxi. He dumped it by a local river, a location where many people dumped garbage. As far as Dorothea Puente was concerned, Everson Gilmuth had outlived his utility and was about as useful to her as a broken bicycle that may have been abandoned nearby, left to deteriorate under an epidermis of rust. Dorothea was so pleased to be unburdened by the presence of Everson's corpse, she was downright giddy. When receiving correspondence from Everson's children, Dorothea covered her tracks by telling them he was ailing and that she was taking good care of him. She took care of him all right. Early in 1986, Everson Gilmuth's body was found on the bank of the river by fishermen. What struck them about the wooden box was its resemblance to a coffin 
The body couldn't be identified because, due to the moisture emanated by the body, the humidity of the surrounding environs, and the scorching California sun, the corpse had putrefied. The stench was more distinct than its facial features by that juncture. It didn't help that a missing person's report for Everson had never been filed. Everson Wilmoth, a prosperous man with a life and an identity, was filed as a John Doe and buried in a potter's field. All he wanted was to be loved. Though Dorothy Puente was still prohibited by the state to run a boarding house for the indigent and the disabled, she benefited from an overwrought system. Social workers had more charges than they could place, and any new beds were desperately needed, license or no license. The turnover at Dorothea's new house was much higher. Dorothea's key requirement of her tenants was that they stay long enough for her to redirect their social assistance payments to her address. Over $5,000 was being deposited into her account every month. Adjusted for inflation, that is approximately $12,000. Dorothea would intercept all incoming mail to her tenants. Many of them, like the alcoholics, were so tuned out of reality they didn't realize that the stipend doled out to them by Dorothea was much less than the state issued. Dorothea was skimming off the top, like the gangsters who used to run Las Vegas casinos. She was even empowered to the degree that she could control when a drunk and disorderly charge stuck. All she had to do was inflate their stipend a little more, and their drunken belligerence would dispatch them to a downward spiral, whereupon they would be collected by police. She would also do things like put some cash in their pockets, call the police reporting their behavior, and she would rent out their room to a transient during the 30 days the drunk spent in jail. She would still be spending a portion of the drunk's social assistance benefits all the while. She had it down to a science, and the operation ran like a well-oiled machine. Social workers and police never pried because she was taking an enormous amount of casework off their hands. Despite all this, most of the residents enjoyed living in Dorothea's house. She prepared lavish, delectable feasts, as opposed to the institutional food they would have eaten at public shelters. They spent many hours talking and playing games. She may have been stealing money from them, but it wasn't like they weren't getting anything in return. The residents adored Dorothea and would even protect her from social workers who may not have been as taken with her as the tenants were. While this sounds like it was an advantage for Dorothea, she didn't see it that way. For one thing, the longer someone stayed in her house, the more they would witness and it was possible that they might catch a glimpse of something Dorothea would prefer to keep confidential. Her other concern was that the longer somebody stayed, the less often she could rent out that room to another person with a stipend she could skim. This problem only got worse for her since many of the people in her care were older and had grown tired of the rootless existence that brought them there. They didn't want to travel from town to town, nor did they want to walk the streets anymore. They wanted to put down roots. Two such people were Dorothy Miller, 64 years old, and Benjamin Fink. Dorothy Miller's life was destroyed by alcoholism. This addiction plagued her throughout her adult life, continuing up to the moment she darkened Dorothea Puente's door and beyond. She was very taken with Dorothea Puente and invested a great deal of effort to befriend her. Dorothea wasn't capable of real friendship or love of any kind. Dorothea Puente found her long stories of woe tiresome, but she would listen to her nonetheless. One detail of Dorothy Miller's life that aroused Dorothea Puente's interest was the night terrors that robbed Dorothy Miller of many nights of sleep. It wasn't Dorothy Miller's suffering that affected Dorothea Puente. She wasn't capable of feeling empathy. The part of the story that drew her attention was the prescription of sleeping pills Dorothy Miller took at night. Before long, Dorothea Puente was spiking Dorothy Miller's cocktails with doses of crushed sleeping pills that no doctor would recommend. It took a while. Dorothy Miller soon built a tolerance. Her body had been hammered by megaliters of alcohol for decades. 
It could handle sleeping pills, even if they were administered in equine proportions. Nevertheless, it was working, gradually. Slowly but surely, Dorothy Miller became progressively ill. Dorothea Puente waited on her as her condition deteriorated. Benjamin, 55 years old, was also an alcoholic. He was more determined to overcome his addiction. He suffered from health problems due to a bout with pneumonia that nearly killed him. It left lasting damage behind, and he was forever plagued with respiratory problems. He wasn't able to socialize as much as the other rumors because he was always unwell. Though eating in their rooms was prohibited, Dorothea Puente made an exception for Benjamin, since it meant she could spike his food with a lethal amount of drugs. Fulfilling expectations, Benjamin's health grew worse. Dorothea insisted that he remain in his room for the rest of his stay, where she administered to him personally. And that, of course, meant feeding him more drug-laden food. Most of the residents didn't know Benjamin much anyway, so they didn't notice his absence. Meanwhile, Dorothea killed him with an overdose. Benjamin's corpse was wrapped in the same way as Everson Wilmoth's, though experience taught Dorothea valuable lessons, and her methodology was perfected, reducing any possibility of getting caught. Dorothea hired a local ex-con known as Chief to do menial jobs for her for cash. She hired him to dig deep holes in the basement. Her story was that the dirt would be replaced with concrete. The truth was, she didn't have designs on a finished basement, not unless you consider a home cemetery to be your idea finished. Indeed, this was one location where Dorothea Puente buried her victims. She discovered that police found Everson's body, and, realizing her carelessness nearly put her in prison for life, she decided that her basement was a safer bet. Dorothea was determined to pass more victims along this odious assembly line through her slaughterhouse, straight into the vacancies of her domestic necropolis. Dorothea used her contacts in health care to rent rooms to people who were ailing and on the verge of death. They were easier to kill and would not have lasted long anyway. Betty Palmer was a resident of Dorothea's boarding house. On August 19, 1986, she was scheduled for a medical appointment, but didn't turn up. She discovered that Dorothea opened her mail and cashed her checks, and she was outraged. She contacted the issuing agency, and they instituted a policy that required photo ID to deposit the checks. She didn't report Dorothea to the police, but she did confront her about it, and they had a number of heated exchanges about the issue. This was troubling to Dorothea. She didn't know if Betty was going to tell other residents about what she had done. Betty was also not intellectually disabled or in a perpetual drunken stupor. In other words, Dorothea could not control her. The evening of August 18th, Dorothea invited Betty to her parlor to have a few cocktails, discuss the conflict, and come to a resolution. Betty accepted and joined her. Dorothea packed as many crushed sleeping pills as she could into the beverages. She also plied her with kind platitudes, telling Betty everything she wanted to hear. By the time Betty retired to her bedroom for the night, she was delirious with chemically induced bliss. She struggled to change into her nightgown, and she fell to the floor before she could reach her bed. Dorothea was listening from the outside. Once Betty's room was awash with silence... Dorothea and her skeleton crew of seasoned but amateur undertakers went to work. Dorothea decided that it would be for the best if Betty's corpse were unidentifiable, since she had been spreading word around town about what a crook Dorothea was. If the body were found, everybody Betty had spoken with in regards to Dorothea Puente would point their accusatory index fingers in the same direction. After Dorothea and Chief laid out the plastic sheeting, Chief brought his tools to the room. These were never used in their cadaver disposal operation before that day. Using saws and chisels, they cut through Betty's neck and lopped her head off. They buzzed through her wrists to amputate the hands. They ground through the ankles to sever her feet. They also butchered a substantial portion of what remained of her lower legs. 
any part of the body that could provide identification outside of a DNA lab, like the hands with all the fingerprints and her head with its unmistakable face, were placed in separate bags with the intention of burying them at the outskirts of the city limits. Her torso was buried in the basement, where it would be feasted upon by worms and other subterranean scavengers. Chief carried out the task of scattering the various components of Betty Palmer miles away, as assigned. The final duty faced an unexpected obstruction. Sacramento was charred by a heat wave that year, and anyone with the habit of socializing did their entertaining outdoors at night. Dorothea could only bury her victims in the backyard garden, but it became nearly impossible to carry out this undertaking incognito. The street wasn't nearly as crowded, however, save for the occasional passing car. Dorothea and Chief dug a shallow grave a few feet away from the pavement in front of the house. They tossed the torso in the hole and covered it swiftly. As a distraction mechanism, Dorothea placed a statue of St. Francis of Assisi on the spot. A few weeks passed, and nobody reported Betty Palmer missing. With this, Dorothea could sleep soundly, as always. At first, she was unable to cash Betty's checks, but when she was told she needed ID, she altered Betty's to replace her photo with her own. When a social worker came by, Dorothea told her she had a doctor's appointment. After fencing most of Betty's possessions, the room was put up for rent. Business as usual. February 1987. A new resident moved in, Leona Carpenter. She was 77 years old and sick with brain cancer. She didn't qualify for palliative care, so Dorothea Puente's house was chosen as a hospice. Dorothea made provisions for Leona's comfort and care, surprising the ambulance crew with her effort. This was no ordinary rooming house. Leona herself was overwhelmed and would make a point of praising Dorothea whenever she spoke of her with other people. Dorothea began to lose patience with Leona, however. She was reminded of why she resigned from her position as a nurse's aide. It's hard to stay in a good mood when you're unwell, and Dorothea grew tired of Leona's complaints and irritability. Dorothea would delegate some of her care-related duties to other tenants, but the pressure remained. Dorothea reported a high standard of care to the overseeing agencies that checked up on Leona, so it became clear that until she died, Leona was going nowhere. Dorothea could not accept this. She decided it was time to turf her out. Leona was already doped up on medication she was prescribed after her brain surgeries, so it was hardly noticeable when Dorothea crushed up several sleeping pills and fed them to her. Plastic sheeting had been installed under Leona's bedding, so preparations for her execution were already underway. Ultimately, Dorothea Puente would have concurred with the Joker's maxim that slaughter was the best medicine. Dorothea and Chief dug a shallow hole in the backyard. The body was to be stored there temporarily. They intended to move the body to a permanent location when the time was right. Upon arrival at the house, Leona's weakened condition was not long for this earth, and now she was buried beneath it. Dorothea turned her attention to a new resident named Carol Durning. She had been living there for three months, and as far as Dorothea was concerned, it might as well have been as many years. For three months was about as long as Dorothea could tolerate one person in that house. Carol was disinclined to socialize. When the mail arrived, she left the room, knowing that everybody else in the house was expected to congregate in one spot at that time. Given Carol's solitary nature and secrecy, Dorothea didn't trust her as deeply as she could bury her. She was extra cautious about revealing her illegal activities in her presence. Complicating the situation was the fact that residents who didn't like Dorothea controlling their money would support Carol were she ever to be targeted by Dorothea for any kind of ill treatment. James Gallup, 62 years old, was a resident who took sides against Dorothea. He frequently argued with her about his money, demanding that she cede control of it to him. He warned her that if she didn't comply, he would contact the police. 
She no longer had connections in the police department and government to deflect the charges, so she had to find an alternative way to deal with this threat. His disadvantage was that he was very ill. He survived cancer and a heart attack, but he did not emerge unscathed. His condition was on the decline, but he was strong enough to protect and maintain as much independence that remained in his life. His medicine was self-administered, he wanted to control his money, and his room was off limits, especially to Dorothea. Cancer and heart disease hadn't succeeded in killing him, and it wouldn't be a cakewalk for Dorothea Puente either. She did spike his medicine with sleeping pills, but James complained about the somnolence, so she didn't dare try it again. This one wouldn't go down without a fight. James Gallup's independence and iron will were a pestilence for Dorothea, and she found herself ill-equipped as an exterminator. As if this wasn't bad enough, Carol moved out. Dorothea didn't know what Carol knew about her hidden role as executioner and undertaker. Maybe she knew nothing, maybe she knew enough to put Dorothea behind bars if Dorothea couldn't put Carol into a shallow grave first. It was the fear of the unknown, and it left Dorothea in a panic. She couldn't escort Carol to an untimely departure, so she focused on James. This time she ground up enough sleeping pills to induce a coma. She put them in James's food. There were less tenants in the house than usual, so she was less likely to get caught, and didn't. When and where in the house James Gallup died is unclear. What was clear was Chief did some more of Dorothea's early morning gardening hours later. Though she managed to avoid murder charges so far, she did receive complaints about the stench that began to permeate the house. When the residents complained, she cited such causes as fertilizer, dead rats, and plumbing problems. Chief had been laying a foundation for a new greenhouse out back. He was soon to pour concrete over the last vacancies filled by Dorothea Puente's tenants. One night, after a date of hard work, Dorothea invited Chief to her parlor, where she plied him with several cocktails. He was so drunk it was no challenge at all for Dorothea to lead him to the bedroom. There was plastic sheeting on the bed. He didn't think anything of it, despite having wrapped so many of her victims in it. After all, it was always there when he visited Dorothea's suite. She laid him down and started wrapping him up. He was so out of it, he still didn't see how odd this was. He felt his breath inside the cocoon of plastic. He couldn't move his limbs because the plastic was wrapped so tightly. When she began to sew him into the plastic, the alarm bells finally began to ring. A sheet was placed over the plastic, submerging him in darkness. October 1987. Vera Martin became a new tenant in Torothea's house. After checking in and literally signing her life away with all the paperwork that had to be filed, Vera Martin didn't even last 24 hours in this mausoleum disguised as a rooming house. After having a few cocktails with her landlady and apothecary, she was wrapped up and dragged down the stairs. Dorothea was like a freight train, stopping at nothing. She didn't even frisk Vera's corpse to find valuables. Homer Myers lasted two years in Dorothea's house, practically a lifetime compared to most of the people who rented from her. He was agreeable and obedient, never arguing with Dorothea about his money. He kept misplacing the forms that gave his consent for her to cash his social security checks. He was too harmless and dense to pose a threat to her. In an almost unfathomable act of mercy, Homer's life was spared. She did exploit his willingness to help her, though. She persuaded him to dig a hole in the backyard. He was so witless, he didn't realize he was digging Vera Martin's grave. Resident Alvaro Bert Montoya was born in September 1936 in Puerto Rico. He was quiet and withdrawn. He mostly just spoke Spanish and primarily to himself. He was developmentally delayed and a diagnosed schizophrenic. He mostly conversed with personages that were unknown and unseen to anybody else. His lack of addictions presented a problem while he was shuffled through the social services system. 
a representative of the system was impressed with a social atmosphere in Dorothea Puente's home, and it appeared to be the perfect place for Bert, so he moved in shortly thereafter. Under Dorothea's influence, his grooming and eating habits were greatly improved, and with a landlady who spoke Spanish fluently, he even came out of his shell a little. There was even talk of getting him on a regimen of antipsychotic medication. He even helped Dorothea with shopping and yard work. Unlike Chief, Bert's willingness to help was not motivated by personal gain. Dorothea had a friend in Bert Montoya. In March 1988, Dorothea took Bert to the Social Security Administration building. Dorothea was documented as Bert's cousin on his paperwork. Arrangements were made for his money to be deposited into her account. Dorothea was a more effective maternal figure for Bert than she ever was to her own children. The department's mandated psychiatrist officially verified that Bert was not mentally capable of managing his finances. For Dorothea, everything was going according to plan. Social workers checked up on Bert at Dorothea's house and they were struck by how much progress he had made. They proposed the idea of sealing the deal on this normalized life by putting him on psychotropic medication. The normally agreeable Bert balked at this idea. He had taken these drugs before, and the side effects left him feeling ill. He hated medical attention in general. Whether it meant choking down pills or being pricked with needles, he was keen to avoid it at all costs. He was firmly entrenched in this position, and they couldn't force him to do anything. In a psychiatric hospital, orderlies might force him down with five-point restraints. A psychiatrist might inject him with a sedative, and the pills would be administered in crushed form mixed with liquid. But this was Dorothea's house. Dorothea and Bert became inseparable. When she underwent a facelift, he accompanied her and sat by her bed, even though he hated being in hospitals. He waited and doted on her during her recovery, just as she had for him. She would invite him up to her parlor, and they spent many evenings up there together, enjoying each other's company. Eventually, Dorothea distanced herself from him. After all, friendship and other forms of emotional intimacy were not her forte. Bert began to walk the streets during the day, though he was always keen to return home at night. Dorothea got him to dig a large hole for her in the backyard. At his age, this was exhausting business, and it made short work of his energy levels. He complained often of feeling tired, but nobody considered it to be a red flag of any kind, since it was typical of somebody who had been doing hours of menial labor. He complained to a nurse that Dorothea was giving him medicine he didn't like. This aroused the nurse's concern, so he withdrew Bert from the house for the time being. He called Dorothea and requested that she go to collect Bert personally so they could have a meeting about his care. Dorothea was used to people singing her praises when it came to the way she provided care to her charges. This was different. It was an ambush. The nurse demanded to know what she was drugging Bert with. Dorothea was in no mood for this. She became indignant, and her sweet grandmother routine didn't factor into the confrontation. Furious, she shouted, You want him? You want him back here? You want to tell me how to run my house? How to run my business? You can have him. He is so much trouble. All day I'm watching him. You take him. He can come stay here, and you see how well he does. She turned to Bert. You want to stay here? You want to complain about how I take care of you? That's fine. You stay here with all these people. See how well they take care of you. See how well you sleep on the floor here instead of your bed back home. The nurse brought Bert out of the office and discussed his options in the hallway. The nurse took a look at the addicts and other riffraff that waited for service. They were the kind of people who bullied Bert, leading to the kind of mental health complications his life at Dorothea's house was so effective at purging from his life. Taking all this into consideration, the nurse said to Bert, You should say sorry and go home with Miss Dorothea.
She takes good care of you, doesn't she? Bert agreed overall, but he didn't like it when she forced him to take those pills. Dorothea and Bert left the facility holding hands. That evening, Dorothea had Bert up to her room. She force-fed him sleeping pills. He addressed her as Mama, and she identified as such. She told him her word reigned over that of the nurses. She was right beside him as he lay on the bed, groggy, and only vaguely aware of what was going on while she wrapped him in sheets, blankets, and plastic sheeting. He trusted her, so he didn't put up a fight. The next morning, Bert was conspicuously absent from the house. The hole he dug in the backyard was also much shallower. Dorothea's grief was mendacious, just like the stories she told about her life, past and present. Judy Moyes was a volunteer who had been assisting Bert as he was shuffled throughout the many agencies that provided him with housing and care throughout the years. In October 1988, she showed up at Dorothea's house unannounced. She became bonded to him and was eager for an update on his life. Dorothea told her that Bert was ailing and asleep in his bedroom. She promised Judy his condition wasn't critical and that she would take good care of him. Judy didn't detect any genuine sympathy in Dorothea's voice. She vowed to herself that she would check up on Bert again real soon. Her schedule didn't permit this, so she contacted Bert's social worker, Peggy Nickerson. She asked Peggy to investigate. Peggy called Dorothea's house and asked to speak to Bert. Dorothea told her what she told Judy. Peggy was concerned and told Dorothea that Bert's convalescence might be better observed in hospital. Dorothea knew better than to fend off a social worker with curses and threats. She had to improvise. All she could come up with was Bert actually felt a lot better and he had left town. Judy Moyes paid another visit to Dorothea's house the next day. This time around, she wasn't as diplomatic. She wanted answers, and she wanted them immediately. Dorothea concocted a new and more elaborate story overnight. She told her that after Bert recovered from his illness, he became quiet and introspective. He had regrets from his past and was eager to mend fences, particularly with his sister. She and her husband picked Bert up and took him to visit relatives in Mexico. If Judy hadn't known Bert so well, this story might have been plausible. The truth was, Bert had never been to Mexico. He had no Mexican nationals as relatives, and he didn't know his sister's phone number. Judy spent months trying to locate his sister, and was left with the conclusion that she lived somewhere outside the United States, but not necessarily Mexico. She didn't mention all this to Dorothea while she was there, but she was sure she was being deceived. Judy reported these findings to Peggy. Peggy started calling Dorothea for updates on Bert's location on a regular basis. A family holiday could only last for so long, after all. Determined to bring about an end to this business, Dorothea told Peggy that Bert decided to stay with his sister and her husband permanently. They would live happily ever after at their house in Utah. Peggy was skeptical and insisted on being provided with contact information so that she could confirm its veracity with his relatives. Realizing her back was against the wall, Dorothea told her she just couldn't go around giving out people's phone numbers to strangers. She hung up abruptly. Peggy was more suspicious than ever now. She called Judy and asked her to make some inquiries on the street to see if anybody had any information about what had become of Bert. Before Judy could embark on that excursion, Peggy received a call from a representative of Dorothy's network of street people. His name was Donald Anthony, and he had done odd jobs for Dorothea in exchange for cash throughout the years. Donald told Peggy he was Bert's brother-in-law. He frequently name-dropped Bert, even though Bert's family referred to him as Alvero. His credibility held up until the end of the call, when he used his real name instead of the alias with which Dorothea outfitted him.
Now Peggy knew she was being duped. After making some calls, she found out who the man was and about the nature of his connection to Dorothea. It was now time to act. Peggy called the police. Peggy's call was connected to the office of Detective John Cabrera. He was the only member of the Sacramento Police Department who had led a hunt for a serial killer. Nevertheless, considering the need for evidence, it occurred to Cabrera that this development could be a product of confusion or communication breakdown, rather than something nefarious. He did take the report seriously, though. As part of his due diligence, he arranged to visit the house so he could interview Dorothea and her rumors. Dorothea ensured that everything about the house and its inner atmosphere appeared to be as free of trouble as possible. All the tenants were in the living room socializing, laughing, smoking, and playing games. Snacks were circulated by Dorothea, and she played the part of the harmless, friendly old lady. As an actress, this was her signature role. Cabrera knew that some of the most vicious, violent offenders were capable of being charming and innocuous in disposition, so he interviewed her residents individually and in their own rooms. Her tenants had been coached by her, telling a rehearsed story, never deviating from the narrative. They did appear nervous, apparently worried that consequences for slipping up might be immediate and barbaric. Though this observation could not be documented as sufficient evidence to issue a search warrant, the behavior of his interview subjects did insinuate that it was rooted in something that was far more diabolical than the scenarios they were describing as a cover story. One of the last tenants he'd interviewed was John Sharp. He had lived there the longest of all the rumors by that point. He was an alcoholic. He told the detective the same story as all the others and made a point of singing Dorothea's praises. Cabrera concluded that he wasn't going to get anything useful out of Sharp, since nothing he said was in Congress to statements given by the other residents. However, it was with John Sharp that everything diverted in a completely different direction. Before Cabrera left, Sharp shook his hand and passed him a tiny handwritten note. Before saying goodbye to Dorothea, Cabrera pocketed the note without reading it. Dorothea was all smiles. She assumed everything went off without a hitch. John Cabrera got into his car and opened Sharp's note. It was short and blunt. She is making us lie for her. Later that day, John Sharp went to buy a pack of cigarettes. Cabrera caught up with him and offered him a ride. They stopped off at a cafe to have a conversation. Sharp told him about the holes that were dug in the garden and filled overnight. Concrete was poured over surfaces for no apparent reason. Guests who became ill were moved upstairs and vanished overnight. The rotting stench that came and went. The dozens of excuses for why certain people couldn't be contacted. Complaints about personal mail being opened when it appeared a check might be inside. Dorothea's lavish lifestyle with all its profligate spending. It was a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces, but even loosely assembled, a hideous portrait began to emerge. Still, John Cabrera needed to gather more evidence. Cabrera had theretofore been unfamiliar with Dorothea's criminal history, so he ran a search on her record to see what charges she had accumulated over the years. And there they were from her youth to present day. Prostitution, drugging, robbery, forgery, and fraud. He contacted her parole officer, who informed him that not only did she not possess a license to operate a boarding house, but she was legally prohibited from doing so. On November 11, 1988, a team of law enforcement officials, led by Detective Cabrera, descended on Dorothea's house, including her parole officer. They brought shovels. Cabrera wasn't able to obtain a search warrant, but he would have been able to shut the house down since it was unlicensed. Dorothea welcomed them in and offered them coffee. She allowed them to search the house. Cabrera saw a red flag in Dorothea's collection of books about prescription drugs. 
The books were dog-eared from years of consultation. He detected a foul odor in Dorothea's bedroom. She said it was a dead rat. He finally asked her if they could dig in her garden. Keen to avoid suspicion, she not only gave her consent, but even allowed him to use her shovel. Cabrera and his team dug, but mostly just surfaced with shreds of fabric and petrified food products. Everything changed when Cabrera came upon a tree root. There was nothing anybody could do to dislodge it. Nevertheless, Cabrera was tenacious. He pulled at it with all his strength until the root gave way. When it did, he fell backwards into the mud. He looked down at what his hands yanked free. A human shin bone. The other officers advanced toward the spot. Cabrera pulled out a shoe with a foot inside. They turned toward Dorothea. She was in shock, and it showed on her face. Her hands were pressed against her cheeks. The horror of culpability left her ashen. Cabrera couldn't arrest Dorothea right away. Many of Sacramento's citizens had buried their relatives in their backyards as an ad hoc potter's field. He also needed to ascertain if Alvera Montoya was buried there. The putrefaction process hadn't progressed far enough to leave him with nothing but bones. Cabrera sat down with Dorothy in her living room. She was on edge, clearly in shock. She said she didn't know how the body got there. She claimed she didn't understand what was going on. He returned to the backyard and ordered the officers to stay put. It was now a crime scene, and he didn't want it tampered with. The next step was to obtain a warrant to dig up the rest of the garden. He would apply for funds from the department to bring in a backhoe to do the real heavy lifting. The next day, forensic investigators dug up Dorothea Puente's backyard. The strips of fabric, which John Cabrera initially surmised were torn from a leather garment, were, in fact, shreds of mummified human flesh. Because of the haphazard way the bodies were buried, the flesh hadn't putrefied and rotted as he expected. It had just dried out. After burying body after body, Dorothea and her assistants distributed hunks of human flesh throughout a wide swath of soil. This dismantled corpse belonged to Leona Carpenter. Dorothea watched the men dig, resigned to the fact that her innocence in the eyes of the law was no longer assured. Later, Dorothea got dressed in her finest clothes and stuffed her purse with $4,000 in cash. She approached Detective Cabrera and said, Am I under arrest? He said, Of course not, Mrs. Puente. She said, So I am free to go? I can go to the hotel and have a coffee? I need to calm down. Cabrera put his arm around her shoulders. He said, don't worry about a thing. I will drive you there myself. A crowd assembled in front of the house. Journalists, neighbors, and other locals were eager to learn more about the ghastly scavenger hunt underway in Dorothea Puente's backyard. Questions were posed to Cabrera and Puente, but they stayed silent. After dropping her off at the hotel, he told her to call him when she was ready to come home, and he would arrange for an escort to bring her there. Dorothea stood and waited for Cabrera's car to disappear. Satisfied he could no longer see her, she called a taxi. She stopped at a bar and had a couple of drinks to soothe her nerves. In a more steady frame of mind, Dorothea booked a plane ticket for Los Angeles, though she wound up taking a Greyhound bus instead. She had known many police officers, and she knew they could be thrown by an unused plane ticket. After arriving in Los Angeles, Dorothea set up camp in a motel room, booked under the name Dorothea Johansson. Soon after, she went on a search for a permanent residence, taking a break to have a few drinks, and met men at a bar. Pandemonium ensued back at the boarding house. So many news trucks arrived on F Street, no other vehicles could get through. Neighbors climbed the adjacent fences to get a better look at the garden. Cabrera had to flash his badge and elbow his way through the crowd to get in the house. By then, more bodies had been located and removed, 
all still in their plastic cocoons. All told, seven cadavers were taken to the morgue for analysis. Police were horrified to see that the watch on one of the corpses was still ticking. It took seven days to identify them all. By conducting a more thorough search of the house, they took a look at Dorothea's records. She was cashing checks addressed to tenants who were no longer living there. There was still no direct evidence linking Dorothea to the murders. But then... Smelling the foul stench that hung in the air in her bedroom, they lifted the carpet. Marking a path from her bed to the hallway, Dorothea, who had a checkered past as a housekeeper, left a dark smear of bodily fluids on the bare floor. It led to the garden out back. Pay dirt. Dorothea's disappearance wasn't discovered until four hours later. Cabrera assigned a manhunt to his colleagues. From the northern states to Mexico, her face appeared in the media. Eventually, the case received international coverage. Strangely, she was able to go about her business in Los Angeles unidentified. She grew tired of the motel and yearned to return to the standard of living afforded by living in one's own house. She met a man named Charles Wilgues and he became the latest sucker to be taken in by her fabricated tale of woe. She claimed that when she arrived in L.A., her bag was stolen and she was left with nothing but the clothes on her back. Her face lit up when he told her he was a recipient of disability benefits. She told him about all the other stipends for which he could have qualified if only he understood the system as well as she. She started talking about cohabitation, and he was put off by how soon this topic appeared in their conversation. She was more pushy about it than he would have liked. Something else didn't sit right with him. She reminded him of a woman he saw on the news. He met with CBS News editor Jean Silver. Silver happened to have a photograph of Dorothea. Charles took one look at it, and she was positively identified as Dorothea Puente. The next morning, there was a pounding on Dorothea's motel room door. When she opened the door, she was first greeted by photographers. The media tracked her down, followed by a police officer who asked her for identification. With no alternative, she gave him her own. Staring her real name in the face, he arrested her and she was flown back to Sacramento. She was hounded by the press the entire way, as the Sacramento Bee newspaper chartered the plane. For the first time in her life, she had no elaborate story of her life to tell. As far as her statement on the crimes, all she said was, I cashed the checks, yes, but I never killed anyone. She followed up with, I used to be a good person, once. Character witnesses were gathered to testify on Dorothea's behalf from among the many people she had helped throughout the years. She denied the murder charges. The fraud charges were dropped as the circumstances were clouded and complex. Her defense attorneys consulted with psychologists in hopes that an insanity plea could be accepted. Though early life stressors were cited as possible causes for her behavior, It wasn't enough to convince the judge that Dorothea Puente was not in charge of her faculties and incognizant of the difference between right and wrong. She was slapped with nine counts of murder. It took a long time to find an unbiased jury since the case had been so widely covered in the media. February 9, 1993. The trial began. Attorneys on both sides argued for and against her character. Monster or mother figure, the jury heard conflicting testimonies. August 2nd, the attorneys for both the defense and prosecution had been very effective, for the jury was deadlocked after days of deliberation. The defense demanded that the proceedings be declared a mistrial. Judge Michael J. Verga ordered the jury to debate the verdict once more with some guidance. August 26th, The jury was deadlocked on most counts, but they agreed that Dorothea Puente was guilty of the murders in the first degree of Dorothy Miller and Ben Fink and the second degree murder of Leona Carpenter. Dorothea was poker-faced when presented with photographs of her victims, both pre- and post-mortem. 
Even their decomposed flesh didn't raise an eyebrow. The only definite sign of life on her face came when she was sentenced to life without parole. She spoke up, saying, I didn't kill anyone. At the age of 64, Dorothea Puente was incarcerated at a women's prison in Chowchilla. Though denying culpability, she reveled in the attention she received as a celebrity criminal, and she enjoyed popularity behind bars. She cooked for other inmates, and her culinary specialties were greatly anticipated. Though still repudiating the notion that she ever took a life, she became fascinated with crime fiction, reading it in novel form, and watching television shows like CSI, Criminal Minds, and Cold Case Files. She declined to participate in religious services for fear that she would be asked to confess. If there is a God, it was her turn to face the music on March 27, 2011, when she died at the age of 82 of natural causes, the final luxury she enjoyed, a luxury she denied to her victims. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.